Good evening, everybody. Welcome along to this edition of Sports View on their media TV. Good evening, Dermot Horner, and welcome along. Hey, Pat. How are you? Great to see you again. We have Joe Joe Waters over there in the good old USA. He'll be in with us shortly, joining us. But for this edition, don't forget to press the red right button on the right hand side to subscribe to our channel. As we know, we, we go through uh, some of the sporting headlines, uh, not all of them, we wouldn't have time to do all of them. But we're going to begin with um, soccer and the uh, overcross channel in the Premiership. Um, no surprise, uh, Man City won their fourth title in a row. And um, I don't know how much it cost them this year. I didn't look at the figures, but there's a lot of dash floating around that club anyway. I suppose, and in fairness to them, uh, 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 apart from all the other goings on in the club, we'll stick to the football for a while. They only lost three games in the Premiership, Darwin, which is a, 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 a fantastic record, you know? Yeah, I mean, they're a good team, aren't they? Let's face it. I mean, they. I would have thought their C team would be good enough to play in the Premier League. <laughs> and uh, in the Premier League, Liverpool came third, but they only lost four games. They had quite a few draws. And Arsenal, who were second, lost five games. They are single-digit games. And after Liverpool, who were in third, Villa lost 10, Spurs lost 12, Chelsea lost 11, Newcastle lost 14 games, and Man U, who got 60 points, lost 14 games as well, Man United. Of course, as we know, and United are meeting Man City uh, in the FA Cup final over ne- next weekend. Um, it's probably agreed amongst people. I was listening to the different uh, sports programs over the weekend that Phil Ford is probably the player of the season uh, in the Premiership player of the season, and I think it's well deserved. Yeah, I think I think he definitely deserves what he's yeah. got. Yeah. I mean, he's 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 clearly a good player. I mean, it, it, there's part of me that kind of goes, this is really good for England with the Euros coming up. <laughs> oh, we don't have a shadow of a Good evening, Joe Waters. Good evening, Pat. Evening, Darwin. Good to have hey, you back. Joe. How are yeah. you, mate? And uh, we, were, we, we, we were just eulogising about Man City winning their fourth title in a row, Joe. And uh, we won't talk about the cash and money spent or anything like that for the moment, but... Uh, I was saying, Joe, they only lost three games in the whole year, you know, right. in the premiership, you know, which is a fantastic record. And the, the, it, there's a consensus now emerging that Phil Foden was the player of the season in the premiership. Would you Would you go along with that? I, I wouldn't disagree with it. I mean, there was a couple of other guys that were, yeah, yeah. I think, um, up there as well. Um, but, I mean, Foden's been... Consistently good for uh, for um, Man City. He scored goals in vital games. He scored in Europe. Um, I mean, he, he scored two again uh, yesterday. So it's kind of hard to um, tonight um, vote for him. You know, with all he's done. Yeah, that's true, and. Um... Uh, well, we know we know now that that, that Luton, Burnley, and Sheffield uh, are, have been uh, relegated, and we know that Leicester and Ipswich will be coming up to entertain us next year. And between Leeds, Leeds or Southampton, will be uh, Leeds looked. I must say they looked very well in the match the other night. I was watching them playing. I think them. They, I think they'll probably beat Southampton and come up. What do you think, Darwin? Would you fancy them? You know, I mean, I, I, I'd probably edge my way towards Southampton winning that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah you can do that. They're, they're, they're both yeah. sort of dark horses, if you know what I mean. I think with Absolutely. Leeds, you know what you're going to get. We've heard uh, down to the years, particularly on the Sky platform, anyway, no one anywhere else, where the English Premiership is the best league in the world. And yes. Uh, none of their teams uh, made any impression in the European uh, competitions this year. You know? They're not contesting um, I mean, there's been a good argument for it for, um, for a long time. And uh, to be honest, 
I, I really don't think that on one season in the Champions League that you can turn around and say that, you know, it's not the most competitive league in the in the world anymore. I mean, I think that's a, that, I think that's going a little bit too far with that. I mean, yeah. Uh, it, to be honest, Man City, Man City didn't lose. They went out in a shootout. They lost a shootout. They didn't lose a game. You know, and yeah. Every, yeah. Uh, you know, I mean, it, a, a shootout for anybody who's been involved in it is is a crapshoot. Well, it's, 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 that, yeah. that hold their nerve at the end of the day, and it. Um, That's a fair point. Yeah, you know, so um, I would. I mean, look at it. How many times in the last say, six, seven years have two English teams con- contested the uh, European final? A few times, yeah. I've yeah, so, times. I can't remember. The last time that two Spanish teams did it, I can't remember the last time that two German teams one, did one, it. one of the two Madrids in a final one time. But yes, they were, but that was probably about uh, ten years ago. It is, yeah, probably a, a long time ago. You know, but I mean, and that was, um, but um, you know, English teams have contested the final. I mean, United beat Chelsea in. Uh, in Moscow, yeah. it is. but again, they won a shootout, so, yeah. uh, you know, uh, John Terry slipped on the turf and uh, missed his penalty, so... Um, yeah, what, yeah. what a shame that was, eh, Jack? Uh, no, it was a terrible shame. I cried myself to sleep that night. <laughs> <laughs> like that joke, yeah. didn't it? Not. Yeah, that one, that one has the photograph on his ceiling. It's the oh, last, yeah, it's the last <laughs> thing he sees in life. John Terry's got his own vodka, doesn't he? It's made yeah. in London, but bottled in Moscow. Yeah. Now we have the we have the unedifying spectacle of the long goodbye for Jurgen Klopp in Liverpool, and uh, he's gone now. There's a new manager coming in uh, two weeks time. But Klopp spent nine years at Liverpool, Joe. I was just saying to to Derwin. I think his record has been not great. Has been I, I would class it as a failure in the amount of money invested in the job. I mean, it would be easy to say that, but, you know, he's he's been at a time when, uh, when City were in their pomp. Yeah. Uh, and it um, would be very, very unfair. He, came, he was at a time as well when Arsenal were rebuilding and, and coming through um, with, uh, with some very good teams. So, uh, you know, Chelsea as well. It, I mean, just remember, it's only been the last few years that Chelsea have, um, have kind of foundered a little bit. And also at that time, you know, Tottenham were, were flying under Pochettino as well. So... Yeah, you know, Tottenham made it to the Champions League final. Um, yeah. Uh, so, you know, I I wouldn't. It'd be very very harsh to say that a, a guy that's done what he did. I mean, let's be honest. Benitez didn't do it. I mean, Benitez. If you want to be really fair, if Benitez doesn't have Steven Gerrard in the second half of that Champions League final against AC Milan, then they. Liverpool had no chance. Yeah. I mean, uh, Stephen Gerrard put Liverpool on his shoulders and he carried them through yeah. that. It is. Yeah. yeah. So, um, but I mean, all the ones, Gerard Houllier and Roy Hodgson and Kenny, uh, uh, all the guys that were there before him that weren't able to pull off uh, a championship um, and, you know, knock Man United off their part. Uh, um, like he did, so he deserves great credit for galvanising Liverpool back to. There's no doubt Liverpool were at a, at a low ebb before Klopp came in. They are now yes, a, they are now top top again. I mean, yeah. I will acknowledge that. There's no doubt. But my hero, I know people will give them a, a, a point when they um, vote for manager of the year in the Premiership. The winning the winning manager in the Premiership. 
almost always gets it. I don't know why. Maybe it's the criteria. But my hero for in the Premiership this year was David Moyes. Yes. Well, look David Moyes won the... Yeah, look at West Ham before he took over. Oh, yeah. But look, look at Everton. Yeah. What he did at Everton. Yeah. You know, I mean, he, he won the Premier League Manager of the Year two or three times while he was at Liverpool. All right. Everton, sorry. Yes, he did. Me then, <laughs> sorry, David. <laughs> you, you know, if you if you said if you said to me about manager of the year, I'd actually go for Sean Dyche. Yeah, because well, they, that's uh, a fair point. points taken away from them for basically no reason because their lawyers aren't as good as Man City's lawyers. Yeah, and he still survived. <laughs> oh, yeah, and then, I mean, if you give him if you give them back those eight points, yeah, they'd be in the top ten. Yeah, they'd be nearly in Europe, wouldn't they? Yeah, so well, well, that, that's a very good point. Uh, he has done a, he's done a great job. And I mean, look at Arsenal yesterday. It took him till the, the 89th yeah. minute to beat him. Yeah. You know, so, and, and this is in spite of all that's going on. You know, yes. it's like... And about Sean Boyce, he did an absolute outrageous good job with Burnley. Yes, he you did. Know? Outrageous, you know, just it's, it's, you know, and well, I know Luton Burnley, they're, they're relegated now, you know. But I must say that uh, I'm, I'm a fan of Luton Town, as people know from the program. So, I mean, obviously, I was sorry to see them going up. But the top scorer in the Premiership this year was uh, Haaland, with just uh, 27 goals, which is a, a, a poor return, I think, no, numerically speaking. Palmer in Chelsea. No, I cannot. Huh? I mean how much, of, how much of the season did he miss? He missed a lot of games because he was he missed in, a lot, yeah. You know, and, so... And Palmer, Palmer, Palmer had 21, and Isaac from New, Newcastle had 21, Salah had 18, and my own hero, Morris from Luton Town had 11. No, I know, I, I had to put him in there because... Do you, not, you know, do, you not, do you not think, if you look at somebody like Palmer, for argument's sake, Yes, he's not getting fed the same quality balls as what Haaland is. No, I mean Haaland's got he's got two wing backs. He's got Foden. He's got De Bruyne. Now. He's got he's probably got half a dozen players who are all capable of feeding him a ball, aren't they? Whereas yeah. if if you throw that into the same equation with Chelsea, you prob Chelsea haven't got six players that can feed Palmer. Uh -huh. No. Or, no. One, which I don't rate, by the way. Is it Arm, Arm, Armstrong, is it? Or the other, the number nine for Chelsea? Oh, Jackson? Jackson, that's it. He, to me, he misses as many chances as he gets. <laughs> yeah, he does. But, you know, I mean, let's be fair, though. I mean, that's the nature of the beast being a forward, being a centre forward and a goal scorer is centre forward. You're going to miss as many as you score. And, you know, the, the key is to, you know, get yourself to a place where you're experienced enough not to let it get you down. You know, not to let it overwhelm you, that you're, you're missing yes. a chance, you know. Yes. It's, um, you, you just have to, it's, it's water off a duck's back and, yeah. and you have to move on with it. So Nicholas Jackson has had his... You know, he's a young player that um, I think has got huge potential. I mean, people are very quick. And th this is what does me in about the, the press in general, uh, the sports press in general, is that, that they're as quick to raise you up and put you on a pedestal and then they bring out the axe and they cut it down as quickly as they can, you know, to, to bring you back to, to earth again. Uh, instead of, you know, being using a common sense approach, the young lad is doing fine. He's only a kid. He's doing a, he's doing a terrific job. Uh, he's leveling his trade. And the Chelsea team of the second half of the season is night and day from the Chelsea team of the first half of the season. Well, That's before, true. before we came on, Joe, me and Pat were talking and, you know, the average age of Chelsea team is 22 years old. Yeah. 
and you sit there and you kind of go, well, all right, if Pochettino's left alone and needs to do what he needs to do, let's face it, in two seasons' time, those players are going to be 24 and they would have had three seasons, if not four seasons, under their belt. Hey. And they would have learnt a bit more and they would have been a bit more streetwise and they'd be better players and all the rest of it. And yeah. kind of, you know, I, I think Paul Palmer probably could have been player of the season when you think about yes, it. Yes, he could. Yes, he could. I think that there was, um, I think that there was three of them that had a, a real good shout at it. Um, there was uh, Phil Fulton, there was Palmer and the... Um, the young guy from Arsenal. Uh, the, is it the Finnish lad or Danish lad? It's yeah, there. yeah, yeah. I, I, okay. I, I, I forget. I, 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 I'm around or something like that. Awesome. No, uh, no, I, Odegaard. 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 Odegaard, that's it, yeah. You know, but oh, yeah. You're right. I think the point after, you know, I, I, you must have been um, at a golf thing uh, there just after the League Cup final when Liverpool beat uh, Chelsea um, in that. And they were all making the point of the Harvey Elliotts and all these guys that Liverpool played, the average age and all this. And and I made the point at the time, which now turns out to be very close to the mark, that Liverpool had to play those young guys. Yeah. Because they had so many injuries in the League Cup final. You yes. know, they wouldn't have played in the League Cup final if the, if Klopp hadn't had all those injuries. Yeah. The Chelsea young players were going to play in the, the League Cup final no matter what. Because yes. they didn't have anybody else. That was the makeup of their team for the season. And now you're beginning to see, uh, and as they start adding the likes of Chilwell back into it and they start uh, Reese James back into it and they start getting fit and they start rolling a little bit, then you're going to see that whole thing come together uh, as it is now. I mean, they've, they've done fantastic for the second half of the season. And again, why are people still after Pochettino? I, I, I don't get it with, with why they all want to hang Pochettino out. I, I have no idea. That I don't get it. There must well, have been, there, there has been figures in there, there has been figures in soccer down through the years who have uh, um, who have been treated like that in the media. And John, you you and I remember consistently and persistently the media went after Brian Clough, even right. if he, even if he blew his nose the wrong way. I mean, Brian Clough proved himself to be a magnificent manager and should have been the manager of England for years. I mean, he won back-to-back -back European Cups with Nottingham Forest in 78 yes. and whatever. I mean, really, he has a record the second round. And he got consistently put down in the media, you know? Well, he did. And you also have to remember as well that Brian Clough, within two years of getting Derby County uh, promoted, I think the second year they won the first division championship at at Notts County or at Notts Forest. He got the first year they got into the the first division. He won yes. it. <laughs> it was two very unlikely clubs that you would yes. imagine that would ever uh, win the Premiership. And the, the basis of that team in 1974, 75. Or maybe 1973, 74, uh, under Dave Mackay, won the league again. And yeah. it had Roy McFarlane, Colin Todd, David Nish, uh, Roger Davis, uh, uh, yeah. Alan Hinton, uh, yeah. all those guys. Uh, I think by that time, uh, Kevin Hector and John O'Hare were gone. Um, I'm trying to think who else was. Um, was in midfield from oh Bruce Rierk was a bit oh, yeah. it was up front. Francis uh, Lee. So just uh, you know, I have a photograph played against that team of myself and Archie Gemmel in the challenging for the ball that I had somewhere around the place, and it, it's yeah. like, I mean, just a, an absolutely fantastic team, you know. Yeah. And uh, and they I, were, all, you know, mostly all clubs players. 
I think what we'll do, uh, if you want to do a bit of digging, what we'll do for next Monday night will be a, a, a special, a half a special on Brian Clark and the teams and the personnel he dealt with on the teams. So here's one for you. Where did Brian Clough start then? Can you remember? His managerial? Yeah, his managerial career. He started at Hartlepool United. Hartlepool. Right. And he learned to drive the bus, the team bus, so they wouldn't have to pay another person to drive the bus to away games. Wow. <laughs> That's a great... Can you imagine you're going to driving the bus? Yeah, there you go, right? The wheels on the bus go round and round. Yeah. <laughs> Just the wheels on the bus go round and round. And can you imagine? There's some unbelievable, fantastic stories about Clough. Uh, I'll yeah. give up a few between now and next one, then we, we, we might take some of these. There's some smashing interviews he's done as well. Absolutely. Speaking from the, the court. There's, you know. um, there's, uh, it's worth trying to find it. Probably, it's either on BBC iPlayer, but they, they basically pulled as many of the players together from that uh, Knott's Forest European Cup win, the first one. Yeah. And they've got like Tony Woodcock and, and um, John McGovern. Yeah. Um, they've got a lot of the team together in a bar and they're reminiscing. And Tony Woodcock tells a great story about Clough. Then he turns, <laughs> Clough turns around and says, I want you to come and play for Forest. And he's like, you're kidding. And he's like, why would I be kidding about that? I've made the time to come and talk to you and all the rest of it. And then he literally turns around and says, and by the way, do you play squat? Huh? So Wood, Woodcock apparently turns around and goes, "Not really, but I know, I know what it's about." Right? He says, "Because the person I normally play with can't make it. Come on, you're coming to play squash." <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, they, actually, Woodcock was a Forest player, and yeah. he was on loan to uh, Doncaster. Yeah, and Puff went to see him and looked at him and said, "You know what? You're coming back here." Yeah, yeah. Like it, it's, it's Woodcock in this interview says Pete, Peter Taylor came to one of the, the games when he was out on loan and literally came back and told Clough, we've got a player out on loan, he should be playing for us every Saturday. Yeah. <laughs> like, what, are you, what are you talking about? It's like, this is madness. Why is he out on loan? Yeah. Uh, and that's Woodcock kind of got back in through through that, basically. Right, yeah. Well, there's no doubt that he was. Um, I mean, you miss people like that in South I know you kind of go back, but we have to look forward in mind. But you miss football men like that, you know, who were absolutely genuine characters and had the, 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 the love of the game really in heart, at heart. And as you said, Joe, that story about learning to drive a bus to get his license. Yeah. Like the bus, right? he, um, he had a great autobiography out. I'm not sure if it's a biography or not a biography, but um, uh, the title of it was Nobody Says Thank You Anymore. Oh. And it was, I mean, it's a, it's a, a thick read, but it's a great read. Yeah. Um, and I, I read it, and uh, it's just amazing the amount of things, you know, that... Um, you I mean, have you the book? He's a brilliant player. Huh? He, was, he was an outstanding player. And, and, and yeah, he, he, played, he played for England too, didn't he? Huh? And Sunderland was absolutely unbelievable. Yeah, he yeah. played for England too, didn't he, Club? Yeah, he did. Yeah. 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 Um, sports News is the program here on their media.tv. Tell all your friends about us. Press the red button uh, on the right hand side to subscribe to our channel. So next Monday night, which will be the, the 27th of May. We're going to devote about half the program to Brian Clough Inc. and Incorporated. All his audiences, all uh, as many funny stories that we can get on him, and the players that he nurtured, and the players and the fantastic teams that he molded as well, you know, Brian Clough. So we'll have that on next Monday, plus all uh, anything else and uh, other news. But um, we'll just move on to rugby for a minute. Uh, rugby Union, the United Rugby Championship is coming to its conclusion and uh, 
Munster beat Edinburgh in Scotland Friday night, 29-26. A cracking game, I saw most of it. Uh, Connacht uh, went down to the Stormers 12-16. And Ulster beat Munster 23-21. So it's coming down to the business in, as they say. Same the top 14 over in uh, France. Owning the Ogar team with a good win. La Rochelle, 25-22 over Powell. The European final is on next weekend. The European final in rugby has been contested. It's played over in London, Gavin, uh, I think, besides you. Toulouse and Leicester. And Leinster, I beg your pardon. Toulouse versus Leinster at um, a quarter to three next Saturday. It says in London, but I'm, I'm, I don't know where they're, they're, they're surely going to be. I think it's Twickenham. 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 Yeah, I said Spurs. Stadium, oh, is it? it? It's at Spurs, is it? Yeah. Is it, is oh, it? Yeah. It's on there at the quarter three on, on uh, Saturday. So, Toulouse, my God, you see Toulouse playing this year. I've had him in a few games. There's, there's mountains playing in, in the pack. Mountain, huge men, huge men all together, you know. I wouldn't even uh, come, I wouldn't even be on the sideline while they're playing. They mind on the field of play. <laughs> they're really just me, you know. But anyway, we <laughs> <laughs> we wish both teams I'd say they, they, uh, a stake wouldn't do th th those guys any good to be too small altogether but anyway since scale of anyway that's on next uh, Saturday over the golf over the weekend we had uh, the PGA tournament and we had uh, Scotty Scheffler in an orange jumpsuit uh, just to make it more exciting uh, over the weekend in Valhalla I think just we go to Valhalla we go to go Go to the go to heaven. Uh, but heaven. Scotty got um, Scotty, Scotty got pulled in. The thousand in charge of the prison, the cell where he's been when he was brought back to the station. When he came in, the sergeant is it was a golf uh, fanatic, and when he saw him, he got such a shock. He he he, he, he was running around to find out what what's he doing here, you know, fingerprint and all this, and he said he's he's playing in the tournament. A few of the cops didn't know who he was. And the sergeant said to him, um, have you had anything to eat? He, he didn't have his breakfast because he was on his way, as we know, to the practice ground. I presume he'd have had his breakfast in the clubhouse and under that. Yeah. So he shared his sandwiches with him. You know, there you go. That's when I ain't your friend. But, uh, he did well enough for the tournament. I saw an interview with him um, this morning. Yeah, and uh, he was he was speaking about the event. And yeah, what, what happened and what have you, and um, it, according to him, he didn't know what had happened, and he was just on his way to his practice round, his warm up, his practice round, get something to eat, and he had, he, he had no clue about what had happened up ahead. Uh, as to why he would he was never get through, and all he was trying to do was get to it. All he thought was that it was a backup of the crowd, you know, trying to get in. Oh yeah, was crowd. Yeah. And um, and I, I mean, one of the one of the things I read in it was, again, it's the press and a reporter sensationalizing something, according to him. Yes. That, Oh well, he's a professional golfer, and he thinks he can do what he likes, and this yeah. uh, yeah, he doesn't have to obey the law and what have you. And I mean, that that's the stuff that that really does goes against the grain for yes. me. You yes. know, when they just take it upon themselves to make assumptions of what uh, has happened, uh, and it, so it, 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 and it, again, you know, people could now look at this from. A, I call him the most insensitive, you know why, uh, it's ever been, just because there's somebody has, you know, their life has ended up ahead. But he didn't know that. And no, 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 no. I mean, you're yeah. right. They, they made too much of it as if he was aware of the walker in the golf club that, that got killed crossing the road. I mean, he yeah. didn't know about that. So, but I think that um, they're just on the golf uh, is, what kind of a course is Valhalla? It, I know it's a par 71. It's uh, yeah, I mean, 7,609 7, yards. 
yeah, I mean, Valhalla's, I mean, they play one of the, it's normally a par 72, but they play one of the par fives as a par four. But um, for the tournament, it's 71, but for members, it's 72. But yeah. Valhalla was, has been basically purposely built a few years ago as a venue for the PGA or the US Open. Um, mine, is, my, my, mine is 21. I mean, 62, 68, 68, and 65. So that's. Yeah, but I, I think. I think. I, I think the, the problem. The problem that America has with their majors is that nine times out of ten, they're playing in pretty much perfect conditions. <laughs> yeah, they're yeah. playing in good weather, they've got sunshine. It's not very often they get hit by a 70-mile-an-hour wind and they have to battle their way around St. Andrews in rain yeah. and 70-mile-an-hour winds, do they? Yes. They're um, playing perfect conditions on a golf course that is perfect. I mean, you are talking about perfection. You know, those greens will, will be like carpet when you putt on it. And I think, you know, if you made the comparison between the, the Open in Britain and the US Open or the US PGA, yeah, you know, you can't. They they are that's chalk and cheese. You're talking about two different things. When when they play open courses and it's good weather and there's no wind, they rip them apart. Yeah, because the own hard and the yeah. ball runs and it goes like filio. Minus twenty one. Minus twenty one to me is, is... close at the open in Britain. Then you've got conditions which that golf course was basically built for yeah, yeah and i think that's the thing that makes it look a little bit um makes it look like it sounds easy but you are talking about the best players in the world playing on i understand that yeah. it's on perfect golf courses yeah and, yeah uh, i mean i've seen like that was saying i've seen so many golf courses uh in, in around here i've been on a few of them when we've traveled them out yeah and I mean, that's exactly what they are, you know. I mean, we had the they they are they are like your living room when you're putting yeah. on the on the, on the, the things, yeah. and, and that's the problem. I'd be interested to go back to when the um, when the U.S. Open was held here in University Place where I live, uh, down at Chambers Bay, and what that finished because that. The Puget Sound runs down the side of Chambers oh, yes. right? And the wind is always howling down through there, coming down or up it. Yeah. Um, and it is truly a lynx type course. Yeah. It is, uh, it, it's got rough on either side of it that's built on sand, yeah. you know. So now the, the course may not be as long as some of the other ones, but they made the greens absolutely yeah. treacherous for yeah. for that. And the the players complained about it. That it was too difficult. Yeah. You know? And and it's like, hang on a second, because I went on a tour with it with my good friend who unfortunately I lost a couple of weeks ago. And uh we went we went down to have a look at it and uh one of my ex players was working on the golf course and he got this on a car and yeah. sent us around on a tour of it. And you know, you're looking at the, the holes and talking to the person yeah. and uh, and I said, but you know, won't the pros overwhelm this course? He said, they could very well do. He said, they could very well do. He said, but the placing of the, the pins on each day are going to be so difficult yeah, that that's going to make all the difference with it, uh -huh. you know. So uh, it was the greens. So after the after the open finished, uh, and they they're getting the feedback from the pros and what have you, their, their complaints you would never have another U.S. Senior Open, you know, uh, open there until you correct the greens until you get a different grass yeah. on the greens. Yes. So they, they had to tear up all the greens and redo them. See, the interesting thing about that is, like the comment there about the greens are too difficult, right? What what protects Augusta from being ripped apart is the greens. It's exactly. And, 
thinking about what you said. Um, we, you sit there, not one player on the planet will ever go back to Augusta and say, you need to rip these greens up. They're, they're getting silly now. Now, I, I saw something a couple of years ago from Woods in his pomp. They did basically like a tracker. So Woods basically over something, it was done over something like five US Masters where they tracked where his tee shot went down the first, on the second, on the third, where his second shot went, where his third shot went, and so on. And Woods basically was playing, it was something ridiculous. There was a few holes where he basically was with within a few yards of where he was last year. And they did it after round one, round two, round three, round four. Yes. And he was a couple of yards out from everywhere he'd always been. Yeah, what in in that spell uh, when they looked at it, um, they then worked out that when he won, it was because he putted well, and when he didn't win the Masters in those those five years, I think it was, it's because he didn't put, he didn't have the the same putting uh, average. Average. So does so the greens did him in? No, that Augusta is is protected by its green, and. And all right, Augusta is Augusta, so they've got this aura that you can't run at Augusta. You can't. You, the, the commentators and the journalists aren't allowed to call them spectators. They're, they're I can't remember the word they use now. It's like they're partners or something. When you got a ticket, you're a partner. You're not. Um, you're not a spectator and all this business. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. When when you hear like places like Joe's talking about, you know. They, they've done the same um, with, I think it was Shinnecock Hills, where they complained about Shinnecock was, was too hard. And that's because it, it tested them. You know, and they, when, when it, you know, a lot of the Americans won't come and play in the British Open. You know, there's, there's quite a few of the Ryder Cup team for America won't play in the Open. And that's because they don't like the weather conditions. You know, they'll play St. Andrews because of the history. But when it's Carnoustie or Royal St. George's, which are the two yeah. hard... Yeah, they, yeah. They, like, they, they, like, they like the sun and go back. And exact, exact, from yeah. those. Alexander Sharp won, <coughs> won $3.3 million for his four rounds of uh, 62, 68, 68, 65. Okay, now he finished minus 14. He... he he had a 69, 69, 62, and 70. He finished on fifth or sixth. Uh, his dad was on the course uh, on the Saturday for him to see him shooting the 62, which was a nice, nice for him. He won $640,000 for his four days, so nice. Um, was his name? McElroy, uh finished further down the field. McElroy, of course, uh, Rory McElroy, that is, has filed for divorce from his wife. And I, I think all these things do affect people, you know. They, they do affect people, the same as Scotty Sheffler was affected by that, 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 that incident, oh, you know. I, I think, I, I think what, what everybody, I think what everybody forgets is that, you know, I think McElroy sometimes puts pressure on himself by saying stupid comments. Yeah, and, and I think McElroy is, you know, everybody goes, oh, it's McElroy will win a major this year and different things like that. But you know, we've talked about it on the show before. Yeah. You know, you go back to to the seventies. There was probably half a dozen people playing in a major who could win it. Yeah, you'd get the odd one who'd come through and get lucky and win it. Then you go to the eighties, and that probably turned into a dozen players that could win it. Then you went to the 90s and it was possibly, you know, two dozen players who could win it. But now, I think if you play in a major, you know, if there's 150 guys playing in the USPGA on day one, there's probably 80 in there who can win that. Well, I love watching uh, Bryson DeChambeau, who was in the lot for uh, PGA to Xander Schaffler. At minus 20, he was one stroke shy. But uh, my son was telling me today they were all watching him in um, 
he played in the pro am last year, the JP McCann's pro am in a dear manner with Tiger Woods and all that. He said the way he hit the ball, it just, just I was saying to them before we came on here, they were saying they take off now a lot, you know. They just, they just take off, you know, all the time. And they were saying that uh, when they watched uh, Bison Desembo hitting the ball, you know, particularly in, in, on, on the PGA, on the 650 yard yard par five, he teed off and then he didn't run onto the green. I mean, really. I mean, I've, I've, <laughs> I've seen, I mean, the Shambo practices um, with one of our suits, and I've, I've stood next to him. And I've actually witnessed it fly 400 yards with a driver. <laughs> I've actually stood there while he did He that. got lucky that day. You know, so <laughs> I, at first, I kind of, you know, when you're kind of, I felt like I was having a bit of an out of body experience. Yeah. <laughs> because he, he suddenly hit one and it just stayed in the air. And to hit it 400 yards on the fly, that gets up to like nine, nearly 10 seconds hang time. Yes. That's, you know, I got to about eight and I can't stop counting because I couldn't quite, you know, when you, you literally are, you stand, I was three foot away from him when he hit it. And I, I couldn't, A, understand the flight, but it was so high. I mean, it took off like a Harrier jump jet. Yeah, and just um, kept, and with the the rain, the um, I suppose I shouldn't say it on on air, but with the launch monitor, the the brand that was, I'm looking at the the iPad, looking at this these digits going two hundred fifty two seventy five two eighty five, and you know when you're just going, that's just broken three sixty, and it's still going, and the the his his Paddy was standing there looking at me and I've like gone, well, I can't say what I said. It began with F and ended with yeah. A. Um, yeah. And literally said, I, I don't think I've ever seen anything like that. And yeah. it stayed in the air. And was it, the, yeah. it was at the time where he was playing around with being a long drive competitor at the long drive competitions, as well as being a, a proper player on the tour. Yeah. And he, he he hit probably six shots that carried between 360 to nearly 400 yards. Yeah. I was behind, uh, eight or nine years ago now, I was at the Irish Open with my lads and we were there. And my son said, McElroy was playing in, the, in his pump and uh, I had, you, you don't get a sense of the power of how far it goes. He said that we should stand behind him at the next tee, you know, when he's teeing off. And I did. He wound up in for his drive. I couldn't see the ball. I couldn't I couldn't see where the ball was gone. It was too far ahead. I couldn't see it. You know, I couldn't I mean, see it. I mean it's I so know, ahead, you know I know the numbers that, that the Shambo um creates. You know, Ben Hogan probably created the modern day golf swing. Yes. And you, you know, it's been a, uh, it's been a rule of golf since probably since the fifties up until really even now that your shoulders turn 90 degrees and you hit turn 45. Now with the suit, I've seen the Shambo, turn his shoulders at, a, at like 144. And it's hit. Now, it's always 50%. So if he's at 144, you'd expect his hips to be somewhere around, you know, the, the 70 mark or 75, that kind of thing, right? His, his hips were... Now, in the old days, it was 45 for your hips off 90 degree shoulder turn. So you'd expect it to be a similar ratio, right? So half again. No, he was at a third of 140-something with his shoulders, with his hips. And he was creating so much torque. Now, I, I question whether 
his left leg, as in from his groin to his knee on his left leg, so his thigh, whether he'd had any stress fractures and doesn't know about it. All right. Because the amount of torque that that left thigh is taking in that movement. I was going to and say that, yeah. So Medically, that's going to have a huge effect on him as he gets older. Oh, massive. And it, and it was funny because he had his physio there. He had his P personal trainer and all the rest of it. Yeah. And I, I didn't ask him why he, he was in earshot. I did it with, with them on their own. And, and his personal trainer turned around and says he had massive left hip issues. And he, his massage guy was there, his physiotherapist. He was saying that they work a lot on his left knee and his left hip. Because when, that's taking on the strain and pressure, is it? Yeah, because your left leg's basically straight when you come back into impact. Now, at 90 degree shoulder turn with 45 hip, you're, you would, nine times out of 10, you were producing about 90 miles an hour club head speed, right? So yeah. if you think of Jack Nicholas in his pump, he was producing those kind of numbers with 90 mile an hour club head speed, right? Yeah. Now, what you've now got with these modern day players, they are creating more shoulder turn, less hip turn than what is normal. So they're creating an enormous amount of torque. But the Shambo is traveling at about 135 club head speed. Jesus. Well, I was watching last night and it's just sensation to watch him now. It's just sensation. I mean, the, the, if, you, if you sat down with a modern day, I, I, dare I say, there's going to be some golf coaches coming through the system who are probably about 15 years old right now. They don't know they're going to be golf coaches. But they are more, that, that era, that, that generation would be more like sports scientists than they will be a golf pro. Yes, yes, because of the because of what's required. So they'll, does, they'll be does, does, does that mean someone like Deshambo won't have a long career? I think you'll find that they will. They they obviously that as you get older, they'll rein all this back in because they can't keep doing it. But yeah, 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 yeah. by the time they get out onto the seniors tour, they'll probably only play six events a year or something like that. Oh uh, yeah. Well, some, if you look at a lot of them now, Garcia's, Garcia's a good example. He's got back issues. He's got left knee issues. He's got left wrist issues. All down yeah. his left side, he's got issues. But he's <clears throat> breaking away and doing golf course designs and different things. Yeah. So I mean, wouldn't the same thing. Isn't the damage already done, though, by this stage? Yeah. They're, 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 they're wrecked. You know, yeah. it's Joe, it, you know, using, using you as an example... You know, if you think of the, the amount of sports science that goes into a footballer now, yeah. compared to, you know, their, 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 their Monday to Friday regime is very different to your Monday to Friday regime when you were playing first division, isn't it? Oh, yeah. yeah. They, they're probably as much gym as they are out on a football pitch kicking a ball. Can you, can you imagine, Joe, the present uh, Man City team going to the, the baseball ground in the 1970s? <laughs> I get. I can't imagine him going to fill the street in the seventies, <laughs> going deep, deep in that big mud puddle that was right in the in do front you, of the double decker stand. Yeah. <laughs> you know, do you know, Joe? You, that that's that's a really good point because if you think about if like we've just been talking there about you know how golf's moved on and and it's scientific yeah. and the courses are fantastic and all the rest of it. You know, you what would George Best be like now when they're playing on these carpets at like Wembley? And this is, I mean, this is the thing I talk about to everybody, you know, uh, when they say, well, you know, the, the veteran players, you know, could not be as good. You know what? For if you took the players of that generation, right, and if you if you took a bird push cast. And then I'll yeah. put it Stefano. And you put them into the modern day uh, and the facilities that they have. And I mean, I, I watched the, um, the City documentary, uh, uh, 
that was on about the treble and what have you. And watching yeah. those guys go through, uh, you know, on a daily basis kind of thing, going going in the pool and what have you. Yeah. You know, the only time we went in the pool was in the summertime to go swimming. Yeah. You know, it, there was no recovery pool. There was nothing like that. There was no such thing as a, a cool down or anything like that. You know, I mean, it it was, I, and those players with the science that's involved now and with the with the training facilities and with the uh, with the dietary uh, regimen that they have would all be exactly they would be brilliant you know the only difference that i can see is that the modern game is changing in the way that the athletes that it's bringing out players now are more athletes yeah. they are more straightforward running guys what have you there's very very few guys now that are little jinky guys that duck around and street ballers that learned how not to fall over and get hurt on yeah. Yeah. or whatever it was. Um, now they're all, uh, that most of them are, are, are built for uh, being able to get up and down uh, the field and, and yeah. straight lines and what have you kind of thing. But, you know, those players, if, you, if you're telling me that a George Best and a Bobby Charlton and a Puskas and a Stefano uh, couldn't play in in today's in today's game, or or any one of them, you could take them out of it, and you would do it. I mean, the same with golfers. Can you imagine what Hogan and oh. Nicholas and Palmer and uh, Player and those guys would be like uh, in today's? Yeah, yeah. yeah. you could add another ten minutes onto them. I mean, oh, yeah. you know, I always that. That comment you just made there about, you know, if you if you brought those players back from the from the, you know, bygone ages, you, you know, Tom Watson is probably, I dare I say, one of the few players who had a little bit of the old stuff, and the new stuff, and a little bit of the new stuff. Yeah, you know, he nearly won the Open at Turnbury. As a nearly sixty-year-old, didn't he? I watched you know, that. Stuart, I remember Stuart that one. Sink, Stuart Sink beat him in a playoff, and Stuart Sink's never, never remembered for winning the Open. All he's ever remembered for was stopping Watson win an Open. That's right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And you think, you know, he, he's kind of crossed. He's crossed both those ages in some ways. He did. Yeah, he, you know, for a period of time, Watson could still compete up until he was about 62. Then his putting went completely. Yeah. You know, and if it wasn't for a really bit of bad luck, he would have won that Open. That, He's, you know, yeah. won it in regular time, not the playoff. He would have been. It was a shame. It was a shame. You know, everyone was really well. You know, you, you think about modern golf technology compared to, you know, some of the scores that. Tom Morris was knocking it around St Andrews in for winning the Open back in seventeen whatever it was eighteen hundreds. Yeah. yeah, you know that his his totals weren't too far away from some of the totals today. Yet he was teeing off a yard from where he'd just hold the putt because that they didn't have teeing ground. So yeah, you take a club length away from the hole you've just putted out on. With a with a ball that's made out of feathers and leather, that you found someone who could sew something that resembled a round ball. Yeah. When you look at the old leather leatheries and and they called them featheries, but when you look at the leather covered hand sewn golf ball, it's virtually square. It's not yeah. round like a golf no. ball is with it. But Tom Morris was knocking it round in similar scores, and they were, you know, they were chipping on greens. They were taking divots out of greens when they played par threes. Yet the group behind would putt out over where you've just teed off. And as we're talking about golf, the wonderful 
nearly called it won again over the weekend. Uh, she won the America's Open, minus 14. 70, 265 in the 71, and she won just under a half a million dollars. But it, it, it's she's just sensational golf for the zone of the body, you know. I didn't see much of that tournament, only half a one round, you know, I didn't have time. But uh, she did very well. Before we wrap up, um, there was a boxing match which was required uh, on over the weekend in Saudi Arabia for the undisputed heavyweight champion of the world. There's a mouthful for you now. And in the fight, you had a glorified light heavyweight, uh, Yusek, fighting um, Tyson Fury. I watched the fight, I watched the whole fight, and um, I don't know what to say other than that. Personally speaking, this is only my own personal opinion. I was watching the final humiliation of a once great heavyweight boxing in on the planet. I thought myself. I mean, the fight to me was very, very disappointing. You know, very disappointing. And to think that the picture behind me there is a. Uh, Cassius Clay standing over Sonny Liston. And for all four of these like myself, either one of those two people would have beaten music and then had a cup of tea and within again I had a, would have beaten Fury straight away after that first fight. You know? That's how the fall of every boxing is to me anyway. This I don't know. Is that about money? Well, they're talking about a rematch now, and then uh, <laughs> yeah. he's gonna get, sure he's going to get a hundred million for that because it's already in the contract, apparently. Oh yeah, well there was a rematch in the contract. You're dead right there, spot on. Yeah, I did. I didn't get to watch the fight, but I read about it, and I, I don't know if you. Um, there's a, a journalist for the Daily Mail that I really like, uh, James Lawton. Yeah, I like James Arden, yeah. And he loves boxing. He was a great friend of uh, Bobby Moore back in the day. Um, they were great pals. Yeah. And, uh, and Lawton has always been uh, a, a, a huge boxing guy. Yeah. And um, uh, I was just, I, I, I like reading his column about how he scored it. He actually, um, he had scored it and he had scored it as a draw. And he thought it was a draw, um, the way he did it, the way he, um, the, the, just like you did, Pat, like you do. With yeah. his, he, he was doing his own scoring on, on him and where they landed and what have you and the, the whole thing. I would agree with him. I would agree with him on scoring, because probably a draw on scoring. Yeah. Because never going to be called a draw, never. No. Even if it was a draw, and I, that, that sounds silly, because for the purpose of the the television and the money, and all that, they had to be a winner. Mm. They had to have a champion. They had to have a champion. But to me, heavyweight boxing is very nefarious uh, thing to be involved in now, because um, um, I, the the fight. With Yusik and Dubois. Now, if Yusik, Yusik was knocked down as they claimed the low body punch. It was not a low body punch. He was knocked out, pointed out, and should have lost the fight. But they, the referee gave him two or three or four minutes to recover, by the way. To me, that last fight finished me with, with boxing. And I've been a fan since 1959. When I listened to Fly Patterson and Amiga Johansson on the radio all those years ago, the, <laughs> the Swedish man uh, knocking out uh, Fly Patterson to win the title, even though there was no professional boxing allowed in Sweden <laughs> at the time. You know? anyway, but the, the, it's, just, it's just a massive big circus, isn't it? I mean, it's the, not yeah. real. Exactly, it's just what it is. I mean, it's you know everything now is in Saudi because of the money, and you know they're, they're talking now over here that that uh, Matey Boy, what's his name, 
AJ, whatever, I can't remember his name now. Um, Anthony Joshua. Joshua, yeah. He should he should have a next he should be allowed to have the next crack at uh Usyk, or whatever his name is. Um, Usyk is actually now going to lose his unified um title because he didn't fight uh, one of the contenders for the IBF. Um, and now they're going to take that away from him. So Joshua is going to be the next one up to fight this guy for that title. So it's apparently all all over yeah. again. When you yeah. think back to the, the boxers we watched, uh, for, uh, like, like, like uh, Muhammad Ali, like Sonny Liston, like Linux Lewis, who was very underrated as a hero, you know, that's a smashing boxer. You know? you know, when I was a kid, me and my little brother, my dad would, was a boxer. And, you know, you sit there and, and you'd listen to him talking about Max Schmeling. And, oh, and right. you know, you, you I, I prefer listening to boxing on the radio, to be totally honest with you. Um, because it, to me, it's real when you listen to it on the radio. Because someone, maybe I'm just an old romantic, I don't know, but it sounds... You know, you've got that. You know, it's a bit like I like watching. I like listening to the cricket on the radio because yes, yes. You know, they they paint a picture of what's going on, don't they? And it, they do, and they talk you to the whole thing. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, that fight wasn't even on the radio the other night. No, because they didn't get around to to putting the the broadcast rights up for yeah. giving up for sale, so they, they forgot they left it go. So, um, I had to listen to Talk Sport, where a guy was actually watching it on TV and relaying it after he'd just watched it, sort of thing. Yes, yeah. You know, he, he would be like, oh, Joe's just yes. hit that. Yeah, I was watching it and it wasn't live commentary, there, was, there, was no, there was no atmosphere in the arena, no atmosphere. No, I mean, you know, the interesting thing is, so... Um, Steve Bunce, who's like the BBC boxing guy, yeah, he he did a big TV thing on, on Saturday lunchtime, like just after Football Focus, yeah. Um, and it, you probably remember Football Focus, don't you? Um, <laughs> so he he um, he was saying that the cheapest ticket was twelve quid to watch the boxing. The most expensive, as in ringside, was forty thousand dollars. <laughs> well, Ronaldo was at ring, Ronaldo was at ringside, right? But he was saying that he'd been talking to some lads, you know, walking around Riyadh the other day. They'd got a cheap flight out for two hundred quid. They were staying in an Airbnb or something, and they'd done the whole trip for about three hundred quid. Jesus. He was. He then said, "And this is half the problem that your your Frank Warrens and your Barry Hearns and." That are all having issues with is is that if if that fight was at Wembley or an AJ versus Fury fight was at Wembley, yeah. the cheapest ticket would probably be about five hundred quid. It would, it would, because that they they whereas the Saudis aren't interested in the gate receipts. No, sport washing, and I should I suppose I shouldn't say Saudi that. The, the Saudi Arabia uh, wants the event. Even even if there was yeah. nobody at it, yeah. And the same with the WT, you know, they're up in arms. The, you know, the end of season uh, tennis uh, cups are played for in the men and yeah. the women. The WP, the WT tennis, yeah, have accepted Saudi Arabia as the venue for the end of t- tournament. But well, I see got, there's quite a few of the women after pulling out. Well, you got Barry Hearn. He's trying to take the snooker world championships away from Sheffield and get it into Riyadh. Yeah, and the Golden. Don't stop me. Anyway, <laughs> and next mean, weekend, the lads, we have two matches. We have the the most expensive soccer match uh, next Sunday between Leeds and Southampton uh, at three o'clock, and at Saturday we have Man City, Man United in the FA Cup. Call it, call it, go. Oh, I think City are going to to win it. To be honest, uh-huh. I'd be honest, I I'd be I'd be shocked if United you know, win it. 
Go on. City win win it. Maybe maybe something that happens and it goes to a penalty shootout and Yeah, I was thinking might like, yeah, I was thinking might like, yeah. Take his penalty. I don't know. I was thinking it might be a draw and uh, and a penalty shootout to be great, but uh, and Harlan to miss the penalty. But um, Leeds, Southampton, Southampton Leeds. for me, Southampton for you, Joe. Leeds, there are Leeds. I have a draw for Leeds, so two to one, lads. It's been another blast, <laughs> been fantastic blast again on another Monday night. But we'll do our Minecraft special next Monday night. I'll have a few tips. I'll find a few archive tips and we'll have a good laugh with him. But um, for this edition of um, Sports View on Monday, the 20th of May, great lads, have you? Thank you, Darwin. Thank you, Joe. And we'll see you again next Monday and keep up the good sport over the weekend. Thanks, boys. See you next week.